Hey, everybody, it's the Plant Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Happy to be with you here today. We're all getting ready, at least in the United States, for an American Thanksgiving. So I thought I would change up Plant Based Business Hour a little bit rather than doing a deep dive with a CEO into their business. I thought I would speak more philosophically and perhaps even politically about what went down at COP. 26. The Conference of the Parties 26 happened in Scotland the beginning of November. And I think many were disappointed that as we approach the conversation of climate change, how can we do that without having, having animal agriculture on the menu, so to speak? But I'm not an expert here, and I wanted to bring in the experts who are and the people who were there. So let's find out really what was COP26 like to be there with boots on the ground, and um, are they disappointed with the outcomes? I bring in first Carrie Varolkier, who is with Cool Planet Food. She's going to introduce herself in just a second. Raphael Podselver, who is with ProVeg International. So love what you do. Um, Albrecht and I have had some nice conversations over the years. So I can't wait to hear from you, Raphael. And then Lasse Brun, who is uh, one of the heads of 50 by 40, a great organization. And I want everyone to know more about all of you. So before we dive in to COP26 and what really went down and will it make a difference? Ultimately, that's what we're asking here today. Let's start with Carrie. Carrie Volkier, if you could share with us Cool Planet Food, tell us all about it and who you are. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for uh, this episode. I'm excited about the next hour. Cool Planet Food is a philanthropic advisory firm with a mission to accelerate the world's transition to a climate forward and compassionate protein future. Um, we really do this by mobilizing as much capital as possible towards cooling our planet by reducing our dependency on industrialized animal agriculture. So we work with our clients to create tailored giving plans, depending upon their goals, from donations to organizations that are really working on a just transition for livestock farmers, to food mm -hmm. policy, to advocacy, to consumer behavior change campaigns, to impact investments in cultivated meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a wide range there. And your clients are usually individuals or organizations? They're uh, both. So high net worth individuals and foundations that are interested in climate change. Fascinating. Okay, that's great. So happy to have your perspective here today and so glad that you made the trip to uh, COP26. Raphael, could you share with us, Pod Silver, could you share with us, uh, ProVeg, what you're doing there? You have a very unique position with ProVeg International. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, um, so uh, my name is Raphael Potselva. I work with ProVeg International. I'm based in Berlin. Uh, I'm French uh, and German. And um, yeah, we are a food awareness organization, a member-based um, NGO based in Berlin with offices in different countries. And we work um, towards um, accelerating the reduction uh, of meat consumption of like the consumption of animal source proteins in the north um, and uh, towards like a transition to more plant-rich diets. Um, we work at different level. Uh, I uh, do like the UN work and everything related to international political processes, but we also have a lot of work going on with uh, schools, with uh, the corporate sector, with like uh, private sector. Um, and we have a startup incubator in Berlin, so quite a lot of different angles, but we try to, to work on, I, I try to focus on the UN uh, stage uh, to reduce the consumption of animal source proteins. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you're really the only incubator that I know of that has a UN affiliate or some kind of political affiliate. Most of the incubators that I know of are really helping entrepreneurs, as ProVeg does as well. In fact, I think you have a bunch of candidates just coming out of the recent incubator uh, month, several month long program. Um, but I don't know of any other incubators that have a policy arm. Is that right? So, so we're, I'm not like an, uh, working for the ProVeg incubator directly. ProVeg incubator is a part of like ProVeg actually of like the whole structure, but we have like um, um, around like 100 people working uh, for ProVeg. So we have like a lot of different like, um, um, you know, like uh, tasks and, and uh, division departments, but like the incubator is like um, the, um, one of like our symbols. I think we opened it three years ago in Berlin. And uh, yeah, we have like uh, now quite a lot of mentors, coaches and success stories from the private sector. Sector, but we also worked, as I said, with our schools, with politicians, with politic, with uh, the you know public sector. So like it's it's a lot of like different things we do. But we're not per se like just an incubator. Like an, uh, we 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 are like a, an NGO, a member-based organization with an incubator uh, in our structure. Exactly. 
Yeah, a lot going on there and very busy. Thanks for all that you do. La St. Brune, if you could tell us about 50 by 40 and all that you do with that organization, um, that would be great. Sure, happy to do so and happy to be here today. Good to be in good company. Um, yeah, so I'm Les Bourne. I'm the CEO of 50 by 40. We are a collective impact organization. And what is that? Essentially, it is we have put together to try to build bridges between the many different approaches you're getting uh, to livestock issues. So mm -hmm. whether it is biodiversity, human health, animal welfare, faith, uh, just transition, human rights, whatever it be, like anything, and most things are connected to the food production and livestock in particular. Yeah. We're trying to build bridges between those different stakeholders and break down those silos we're seeing. So we're trying to, to see the ways of um, unifying some of the strongest voices, the strongest stakeholders to engage in the political scene, in the corporate scene, with um, policy change, with uh, behavioral change, with litigation issues and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we have a very wide group of stakeholders around 70 plus organizations carefully selected and curated to build the strongest movement possible and we have a long-term strategy we call 50 by 40 because our aim is a 50 percent reduction in production and consumption of animal protein by 2040 so our, our vision is kind of in our name and all the different stakeholders we work with have very different ways of engaging. They have very different theories of change, but we try to streamline them to go the same way. And I sometimes joke that we're kind of like an ethical cartel, that we are <laughs> like pulling the strings behind the scenes and finding ways for people to engage. And sometimes we are engaging in something we might not seem to be engaging in officially, but we might be behind the scenes trying to make things happen in the right way. So when you go to COP26, are you representing all of your members? I saw that GFI was also at COP26 and, and they're also a member of yours. So do, are you speaking for everyone or did everyone, every member send their own representative? It's a good question. So when I'm there, my official mandate is to represent the organization 50 by 40, right? So many of our partner organizations, whether it's World Animal Protection, whether it's ECLE, whether it is Healthcare Without Harm, World Resources Institute, GFI, or indeed uh, um, Provet International, they many of these stakeholders have their own people and they speak on behalf of themselves. What I'm there to do is to, I can speak specifically on behalf of the organization and do negotiations, if need be on that, behalf, on that uh, level. But I can also point to what we as a movement want to do. So it is kind of like a gray zone, but like in any uh, any coalition, there is a like a unified approach to things. We're trying to drive forward the same agenda, but also sometimes when it gets very detailed, I have to resort to what we as an organization within our, our, our as being a 501c3 in the US is, mm -hmm. uh, is doing specifically. Okay, well, so let's level set. Thank you for that. Let's level set for everybody. So just, you know, we hear a lot of COP26 and every, many were frustrated that it didn't have animal agriculture on the agenda to discuss when we when talk about climate change. Uh, but maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves. Carrie, can you just level set for everybody? What is COP26? Why the number 26? Um, how often does it happen? Who attends? This kind of stuff. Sure. So uh, COP26 is the 26th gathering focused on climate change. And it's where global leaders um, join together to discuss their commitments to um, climate change reductions. And while it happens every year, we heard a lot about uh, Paris in 2015. And then we know that in 2020, COP was postponed because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, world leaders were in the past expected to uh, review and revise and make renewed commitments every five years. That's changing. And Lasse, you might know more about this than I, but my understanding is that now it's expected that world leaders will uh, renew and make new commitments annually as a result of the fact that climate change is such uh, an, you know, uh, pressing issue for for the world. Um, as far as who gets to go, uh, that was quite complicated this year as well. There are delegates that are um, allowed from nonprofit organizations as well as um, representatives from countries. Uh, there is a blue zone and a green zone. The blue zone is for delegates, so it's the restricted area. 
Uh, and then the green zone is open to the public, which is also focused on climate change, uh, but is much more um, open and accessible to all. Okay, so when you talk about blue and green, you're talking about how it's set up in terms of speakers and stages. And so the general public, I didn't know that the actual general public could attend. I knew that um, non-for-profits, et cetera, non-political entities could attend, but I didn't know that um, members of the general public could attend. So you really have this confluence of uh, people who have a stake in what's going on. So organizations may not have the same stake as the uh, an average consumer citizen. So um, very interesting. Now, the the green, which is open to everyone, um, that's more of a learning session. Is that right? Or there's no real policy being discussed there? That's correct. Uh, it is, imagine an exhibit hall with many different organizations that are doing all kinds of interactive exhibits, learning sessions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were films shown. So it's really a more immersive experience, I would say, than much of what's going on in the Blue Zone. Mm -hmm. And the Blue Zone is much more like a, a UN meeting. Is, is that right? Um, mm -hmm. Well, and I, I welcome Rafael and Lasse to chime in here, but the Blue Zone has uh, a very large exhibit hall and each country has a, we'll call it a booth, uh, where they have a schedule of, of events that are happening that day that are focused on topics that are really relevant to that country, as well as NGOs. And NGOs have booths uh, mm -hmm. and um, there is a lot of content that's being presented at each of those as well throughout the day. Okay, just so that I can give a visual to everybody, would it be fair to say it has a feeling of a very sophisticated science fair? You're saying booths and everyone can go to the booths and see what people are doing. I think of science fairs that have that where you can see what people are working on to advance science. Yeah, I wanted to jump in just like to, to complete what Carrie was saying. Like, so you have like actually pavilions and that's like really like I wouldn't say where the action is, but you can meet quite a lot of people and it's pavilions that are representing um, either countries or institutions, organization, the European Union, the World Health Organization and other um, organization from, from the UN. Um, there was not so many NGOs actually that could afford like a real like, you know, um, formal booth. It was like there were there were like some of them, uh, but it's more like actually like uh, the representation of countries and um, and um, and institutions. And you have like then like gigantic plenary rooms that are like also where you get like you know like the starting um, of the the ceremonies and and things like mm -hmm. that. A lot of meeting rooms, the press mm -hmm. space, press conference space takes a lot of space. But it's actually pretty unique, I think. When you <laughs> when you spend like one day there, you feel that you've already spent like a few days there, and it's really um, a lot of people, a lot of noise. I think. There was 30,000 people this year. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like it was the biggest cup in, in um, so far. And it's really um, a lot of things happening in this blue zone that you can only access if you have like a permanent observer status. So that you need also to get, you know, the paper work done. Or you can also like just ask around and see if other organizations have like still space on their delegations to, to also mm -hmm. like attend. So it's uh, there is like some flexibility. There is a lot of like blurry zones that are a little bit typical of, of uh, those gigantic processes <laughs> but overall it is like a really um super big space with um a lot of rooms and pavilions and restaurants and snacks and people running in all direction we'll get yeah, to snacks in a second i was gonna say pavilions a much nicer way of saying booth yeah okay yes. it was the booth maybe, that maybe think science yeah fair, but... it's the european way <laughs> uh, but maybe i could also maybe Oh, go ahead. No, no, please. I was going to turn it over to you. I was going to last say, I was going to say, well, okay, so we have, you know, 30,000 plus people, um, very dynamic, a lot going on at the same time. It seems like um, lots of information being shared in meeting rooms and presentations and discussions and different areas to access. Um, I'm wondering if the three of you were in the blue or in the green, and then Lasse specifically, I'm wondering who decides on what is being discussed in the blue zones? Starting with last. Oh, that's a lot of that's a lot of questions, but maybe I thought I could just maybe perspectivize it and let maybe yeah. make it quite simple what actually is going on there in terms of Great. getting things together. So, like the 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 mother agreement of it all is the Kyoto Protocol from 1992. That was like kind of what started everything. And then, as Carrie mentioned, the Paris Agreement in 2015 was the first agreement where where all countries got together and agreed that they have to limit. 
uh, emissions by maximum 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, right? So essentially it was 197 countries getting together and saying, there's way too many emissions, we need to do something, and the 1.5 is the max. Then another key point was that they put in place the so-called ratchet up mechanism, which means that every five years, it just means that every five years countries get together and they show their homework because everybody has something to do and it's a global attempt to only go to 1.5 and everybody has a piece of their homework they need to do. So every five years they have to come up and say, what did you do? Well, I closed these plans. I shifted to more plant forward uh, production in my in agriculture policy, whatever it might be. And, and right now it's not looking very good, right? No. So what came out, what before the COP, we were looking at three plus degrees based on, on the trajectory of current uh, emissions systems. When Sorry. you say before the COP, do you mean before the COP this year or before? Before the COP this year, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. But before the COP this year, we were looking at three plus degrees at least, like if everybody continues what they're doing yeah. by, by um, uh, if, if some years down the line, we'll end up in, in three, more plus, three plus degrees. Whereas we, we, as part of the negotiations this year, there was efforts made that likely will have us land at 2.7, which is not by any means enough, right? If you look at where we are now, we're just about one degree above uh, pre-industrial levels now. And you see all the, the floods and all the droughts and all the crazy erratic weather patterns, that's one degree. Imagine if we go to two, 2.53 degrees, it's going to be, you know, sci-fi world. It's going to be like the movie 2012. Um, so we really have to curb this. And then maybe also just like some of the more boring stuff, and I'll say a funny thing as well. The boring stuff is that um, most of the decisions are made before the COP for the, from the countries. And it mm -hmm. goes from being focused on climate change and really goes into foreign policy because most of the conversations are quid pro quo. It's like, okay, yes, I will, uh, I will make sure I do this. I will, I'll make sure I for to cut down on emissions or open this specific trading thing, but then you need to scratch my back. They can be like uh, combining trade and agricultural policies and so forth. Uh, and then everybody goes in and they negotiate that. And then the thing is that it has to be by consensus, right? Which means that that's so difficult. If it was by quorum, it would be much easier, but it has to be by consensus. That's why things really, really drag out as it did this year, because it was very difficult to get India to agree to have a specific mention of coal in the text. A specific mention of coal. Is, did I, did I yeah, hear that exactly. right? Coal. Yes. And then the funny thing is that statistically, it seems that the, the most successful cops always take place in sunny locations. <laughs> okay. For some reason. Um, okay, but we did have some sunshine in Scotland, so I still have hope, Lasse. <laughs> yes, indeed. And that can be rare in Scotland. So maybe that's yes. an extra blessing, if you will. Uh, okay, so we hear how political it is, really. I, I, that, that theme comes through loud and clear that it's not as simple as just having a uh, apparent commitment and the science to do it, but it's the political will. Is that, I'll throw it to um, Raphael, is <clears throat> that the block here? Um, the political will, I mean, like, especially on our topic, I mean, on uh, the shift towards more plant rich um, diets and like agriculture in general, I think it is. I think it's important to remember what Lasse said that uh, both there has been some progress. I think before um, 2015, we were on a, tra on a um, trajectory for four degrees or four point something degrees. So it was it's four degrees is it's just not working anymore at all it's really like you know it was like so so we we, we came now like to about 2.5 2.7 so it, there is like a little we see like some progress but it's very very slow and i think like on the topic of agriculture and food systems it's maybe even like in a way slower um, uh, than on the topics of energy transition, etc., where we had also like um, maybe a bigger boost also behind it, but also from the media and the attention that it had. Uh, it's not comparable. What is good is that in the past two or three three, four years, I think, uh, we've seen really like the discussion about food systems um, coming, you know, to the table. Um, the fact that we had a food system summit this year also, like the Secretary General uh, doesn't mm -hmm. like call for a food system summit just randomly because we had climate two years ago or this and that. It's also because we know that our food systems are so um, deeply broken. Uh, but yes, I think it's, it's kind of a little bit frustrating to see that there is like so little commitments um, on the topics of um, 
of agriculture and food systems. But now we also have like some tools and that's what we're also gonna talk about a little bit more, I think later about the agreements around like methane emissions and like deforestation. Those are things that also allow us, um, that give us a little bit of like, you know, weight and like a, a tool to also bring this topic to the table because with 30 and 70% of like, you know, methane being 30% of the, uh, I mean, animal agriculture representing 30% of the, the methane emissions, um, you probably at one point have to uh, put it to the table. You can also say, okay, we're going to focus on uh, the um, um, the fossil fuels emission first, etc. But um, you know, it's 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 not going to work without like having this discussion around like uh, food system and agriculture and what we eat. So I see like some hopes, uh, but of course, yes, it's it's a little bit uh, slow and a little bit frustrating to see how long it took to have this topic on the table because for a lot of countries and cultures, of course, like you know, diets and the way we eat are very deep, uh, deeply personal and like, um, of course, we all, all want to, you know to 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 keep like some traditions and some, but you know, we we also have to acknowledge that the food system is broken and that you know it's not going to work uh, like that um, um, for the SDGs or for the Paris Agreement or for, for anything that we want to achieve around food systems. Yeah, so, and Elizabeth, can I chime in for one second yeah, here? Please. Uh, because I think it's important for the viewers to know, I mean, a research report that was published in Science Magazine showed that it is impossible for us to meet the Paris Agreement without shifting away from conventional animal agriculture. So even if fossil fuel emissions were eliminated immediately, um, emissions from the global food system alone would make it impossible for us to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So it was really frustrating to show up at COP26 and see how little attention was actually given to industrialized animal agriculture. And I was there for week one. I know that Lasse was there for week two. It is a two week conference, so it's a long period of time. And my hat goes off to ProVeg International. They really made some noise during week one. And um, while this was not discussed during the high level negotiations, it was definitely discussed by many people that were in the blue zone. So I just wanna give a shout out to ProVeg for that, but it is a little bit frustrating and really mystifying that this was uh, a bit of silence at the conference. Okay, let's dive into that because I want to hear the noise that ProVed made and how it was received. So you're saying that people talked about it in the blue zones. My, I guess my question is twofold. I'll throw it to Raphael, Kerry, and Lasse mm -hmm. also chime in. Um, this isn't new news to those in the blue zones. They know that animal agriculture is 14 and a half percent. No, Raphael, That's, go ahead. I see you're shaking your head. You know, go ahead. You're going to so go 20? <laughs> so, so no 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 i mean like you know about the the emissions we actually uh, moved to 20 percent because there was an yeah. article in nature that was reviewing <laughs> yeah. that um we're very careful with that we usually use the 14.5 percent of the fao uh, but it's a very old number so we also wanted to act you know to bring it a little bit more like and also like because my colleague from research is very frustrated to not get like the new data from fao <laughs> but um anyway it's it's um it's like um, yeah, and I also want to thank you for, for the kind comment. And, you know, it's also COP is so big, we actually didn't manage to to meet. Uh, like to It was like just like we, we just like run in, in all directions. Um, but yeah, we had like uh, five or six different side events that we were able to organize in the Blue Zone, in the pavilions. Uh, for example, at the pavilion of the World Health Organization, uh, at the pavilion of the European Union, or like of the French-speaking country, La Francophonie. So also trying to reach very different audiences and not only like always the kind of like you Europeans or like, you know, like northern um, people from the north that already like have some kind of like also discussion around that. Um, I think yeah, it, it's very interesting and efficient because you actually meet like top staff like from the UN agencies that are like attending the event. But um, all of our events were of course full because with COVID we had a limitation of 25 people or 30 people in the oh. pavilions. Uh, but there was also like a lot of like you know streaming and um, the websites worked pretty well actually. Of um, for example the EU or the WHO, you could really attend and there were some people that were like uh, you know commenting from Brussels or from Geneva. So it was it was nice. And interesting but mm -hmm. that's also like the way that i got in discussions with like representatives and delegates from like germany switzerland and other countries it's also like using this kind of like general discussion that you can organize and it is for like a you know a specific audience for the blue zone but you have a lot of like people that are at very different levels and i think we sometimes overestimate how um much knowledge like the general public has on like 
animal agriculture. Um, there is some knowledge there, etc. But there's also like some people that are really genuinely surprised and are ready also to have a discussion about it. So I think there is space um, for for that, um, and it, it works pretty well. But of course, we you know we had a lot of challenges organizationally just because of COVID and etc. So it was kind of difficult to really see ahead how it would work out. But overall, we were very happy to to have those side events and also like, you know, have partners um, from the 50 by 40 networks and others that were also there. So it was it was really interesting. Uh, so let's unpack there. Let me just uh, kind of get in a little deeper. When we say make noise, are we talking about um, having discussions and making presentations and it resonated with people? Or are you talking about really pushing people and holding them to the fire saying, you know, this isn't going to be enough. Animal agriculture has to be here. What what kind of pressure or discussions did the, did, what, what was the tone? Maybe that's what I'm going after when you were able to break through to people. I think it's, it's, it depends like also of the people we're talking to. Some people that I thought were really pretty bad on our topics ended up actually being <laughs> very open about the topic of meat reduction they just mm -hmm. struggle with like you know like where are you positioning yourself are you like you know but they, they they agree with that and they also like um they that was like also like the fact of you know having a discussion with people and like also realizing okay they are they are not um as uh bad or as good or whatever like you, you also realize that i don't think that you can really like push you know people to the cliff and like you know say okay now we, we have to talk about that and uh but yes the the tone was i felt that a lot of like partners speakers and people that we had on the panel were a little bit um fed up um you know in, in a way that we're we, we we don't have much time we know that it's we're not on track and like the beginning of the cop like the first two days even though there was like the the methane and the deforestation things in the first week uh, we had also like you know we have to catch up we didn't have a cop last year we didn't have strong commitments we didn't have like anything that looks like a, a, a just transition like you know in both on, on on all sectors so so there was like a lot of expectations and that's why maybe like there was more disappointment at the end um even uh -huh. though there actually was some concrete commitments so it's, it's i think we also have to put everything in relation uh, but happy to hear your thoughts so let's talk about those commitments because in the first couple of days we did see here read that uh, 100 plus countries, as I understand it, committed to reducing reducing methane emissions by 30% by 2030. Lasse, maybe if you want to um, delve into that a little bit, who who committed, I guess, you know, 100 plus, who did you want to commit that maybe didn't? And was this uh, a good start for the conference? Did you think it was going to really catapult into something else, something more for the conference? Yeah, so so maybe first before I, I just get into that, I also just wanted to mention that, um, I mean, I could also save that for later. I do, do want to mention things have changed. I just want to make sure that, um, you know, things have changed over the years in terms of agriculture and, and the COP. I've been going to the COP since 2009 and things mm. have changed very, very much. I clearly remember 2009, there was one side event that mentioned anything about meat reduction right? One out of the whole cup. So things have changed. Things have moved. There's still not enough attention, but actually it has changed a lot. And the, the, and the noise made around it this year in particular has really will, you know, benefit and, and move things in the right direction as we look to, to COP27. But there so can be two different be, conversations yeah. there, right? You can talk about methane reduction without talking about animal agriculture. So... Mm. Exactly. No, but I'm not talking about the methane specifically. I'm yeah. talking about like the focus on meat reduction yeah. generally. Okay. Um, the methane commitment is in, in principle could be quite, you know, um, useful. Uh, the problem is there's not enough focus on agriculture, let alone livestock issues. Yeah. Right. That's one thing. The other thing is there is a tendency to look towards uh, technical solutions, which in terms of uh, feed for the animals and biogas digesters and so forth, which I know there's differences of opinion on, depending on who you ask. I personally think it's a slippery slope in the same way as we have seen it happen with, uh, for instance, uh, uh, carbon capture and storage within energy, solar, ray, solar radiation management and so forth, all of which are technical solutions that aren't really proven to, to work, that are used to have an approach that means you have, can have the cake and eat it at the same time. Mm -hmm. So nobody wants to cut down on the meat. They want to still eat the same amount of meat or animal meat. 
um, and also, but still have emissions reduction. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to do both. So I, and you know, the, the, the carbon capture and storage aspects within the UNFCCC for the energy transition has really delayed the process towards more renewable energy for years and years and years, because the countries that did not want to change their production methods of energy was clinging on to uh, hopeful potential technical solutions that would would solve things. So anyway, so sorry for the digression, but I think it's important to give it in perspective because when as soon as we started talking about sustainable intensification or, <laughs> or sustainable improvement and so forth, we're venturing into something that is one, two, maintain everything in the same way, but not changing practices, whether it's production, whether it is consumption and so forth. And that always delays the eventual change we have to see. And as been pointed out already, it's not a matter of if the change comes, it's when the change comes. So it's, it's a, you know, the sooner we can act, the better. But coming back to the methane pledge. Well, to, to be frank, I, I did not spend too much time on it there, although it was advertised heavily. And of course, it was interesting to see who put it forward. Um, because again, I think it is, although there are some interesting aspects to it and we can work within the framework of it, it is, it, it really worked as a deterrent mm. or distraction for some of the bigger okay. conversations on the, the necessity to reduce. Yeah, I want to get Carrie's opinion on this. I know she has one as well, but I'll just say for me, when I read that, I thought, well, that's like telling someone who hits their head against the wall as like a, a a point of neurosis or pain for them. Don't worry, I'll just make you a better Advil. So it's not fixing the problem of, of you know, it's like someone who's cutting themselves because they're in deep pain. I'll make you a better Band-Aid. Well, the planet's bleeding out. It's not a Band-Aid that we need. We have to fix the source of the problem. That's what it seems to me. And uh, switching the food is is potentially a very bad or distracting Band-Aid from my perspective. But Carrie, I know you were thinking like, well, maybe it's a stepping stone to get us where you need. We need to yeah, go. well, listen, uh, I'm an ethical vegan. I'm, I'm not in favor of feeding cows seaweed to reduce methane as the solution, right? But just to back up a little bit, um, the methane pledge of a 30% reduction in methane by 2030 is great. Uh, methane is a greenhouse gas that, while short-lived, um, has more heat trapping power than carbon dioxide, trapping 84 times more heat over 20 years. So we need to tackle methane. Uh, however, what was, um, I guess it was a deafening silence that cows were not mentioned at all um, during any of the discussions of the methane um, pledge. And in fact, in the U.S., our Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, said, and I can quote him, I don't think you need to reduce meat consumption to get to that. Um, so in the U.S., and it seems globally, we are really going to be banking on food additives or different feed um, or capturing methane um, to biogas. And that is uh, going to tackle one tiny bit of the problem in the short term, but isn't addressing biodiversity loss, antibiotic resistance, deforestation, <laughs> clean air and water. I mean, we've got all of these other things that are caused by our um, industrialized animal agriculture industry that need to be changed. So I, I think that we should talk about this at some point. It seems like the idea of discussing uh, reduction is an electric third rail that nobody wants to talk about at high levels. Um, no one wants to tell someone else how to eat. We know that there will be um, impacts on the global south, and we can talk about that. The global north is really the problem with our consumption. Uh, and so I think that the fact that it wasn't mentioned as part of the methane pledge was surprising to those of us that are really close to this issue. Surprising and disappointing Some, from a lay yeah. person's perspective. <laughs> I'm so tired of hearing politicians talk about it. I don't want to hear one more snappy pledge, 30 by 30 and net zero by 50. I, I just like, what the what the flip like where where's the where's the action and when you say that you're addressing climate change without addressing animal agriculture we know that that's a a, a mathematical impossibility so the rest is like sort of laughing in our faces like are we supposed to take you seriously i'm sorry if i sound jaded i'll let anyone chime in who would like to set me straight if you need to 
I see no one feels the need to set me straight. Okay, so we we no. share this perspective. No, go ahead, anyone. No, I I, th I think you're right. I mean, there's a lot of hesitation there, but I mean, it's also important to keep in mind a lot of the time, most countries or countries' delegations or even the country's governments who are represented there uh, either feel locked in to something they cannot change right now, mm -hmm. whether it's locked into the government or into the constitution, or, um, or simply don't have the means to 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 change things, right? So, so often it's not necessarily. There's been a lot of talk about lack like, of political will, and that is a really big issue. But often it's also something simple as knowledge. You'd be surprised how many high-level decision makers, politicians, and particularly, and something we could venture into at some point: the finance aspect. Ministers of finance who have very little knowledge of the by benefits of shifting to more plant-based food production and for instance, well, like, like all the long-term benefits and all the immediate long-term benefits. Um, and also, you need to keep in mind that, and, and is, this is like looking more to solutions aspects of it, why are countries so re reluctant? Well, countries are reliant on delegations, and in those delegations are experts, right? And for the last 20 plus years, everything has been about energy and transition. So you have the most skilled energy transition mm -hmm. experts sitting there. And if you go into any delegation, like say the US delegation right. of US representatives, they maybe have 50 experts and maybe 48 of them are energy and transportation experts or maybe some on, on carbon capture and stars and so forth. And maybe there's one person with expertise on agriculture and land use and they might not know much about livestock. And, and it sounds crazy, but that often is the case. So there is this issue of uh, what you can call stranded assets within those in institutions and, and those governments, because the, the experts that are sitting there do not have knowledge of the issue. And of course, you'll meet some resistance if somebody comes, guys, forget about that 50% of what we do now has to be about livestock. There you go. And they're like, we know nothing about this. So where do you start? Do we like sack everybody? Do we reschool them? Sometimes it is simple as that the knowledge and the institutional knowledge about the issue needs to be put back into those places where the decision makers are. Okay, so I have so much to hop in there about. Um, is it difficult to get a plant-based food supply expert? A bit less, it's not plant-based. Let's not even start with, let's say, our agenda, if someone were to criticize us for that. Let's just say someone who knows food systems, who is not on either side of the aisle or maybe even eats meat, but recognizes the inefficiency of the global food supply. Forget is it animals or not animals? Just it doesn't work as it is. And then you can say why and you would come up with animal agriculture. But someone who's an expert in food supply systems, how hard is it to get them into these rooms? And then I'll just squeak in here before you answer that. Uh, this week, Biden came out really making a strong case for why climate change impacts our bottom line. And I thought that was the first time I'd ever heard him speak like that, unless I'd missed it before. But he was really coming out and saying that... Um, you want to get on board because this is going to affect your wallet. And I thought that was very interesting. So I'll take comments from anybody on either of those. Um, maybe I can jump Please. in. Like, I, I think, you know, like the experts, they're actually already in the room uh, oh. quite often. There is like people that have like deep knowledge of food systems. They're just not in delegation. They're mostly like at the FAO, at UN environment, um, in different like your UN institutions. And they, they, have been like you know very clearly on our side uh, with like you know some differentiation etc but like very clearly every un report that you will read in the past five years that talks about food system almost all of them um, are um, mentioning this topic with you know food waste and other topics around food systems but it's been like discussed like now i mean it's been took some time as Lassa said but in the few last few years we really see an acceleration in that i think what is like a little bit lacking and that's what just Lassa just mentioned on the economical benefits because governments uh, they come to cop and they're ready yeah they, they 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 want to look good you know they don't necessarily want to make like the worst cop possible except for maybe a few government that you know uh, just like refuse to acknowledge climate change etc but like in in 99 percent of the cases they want to make commitment to look good to also like make the you know to reduce like the um to to get cl as close as possible to 1.5 but we need also to provide them with really the arguments and like hammer those arguments about like job creation about the economy about the future of food about all these things especially in the north. 
Food, food security mm -hmm. for the South, it's also very important. And that's what the FAO is sometimes bringing to the table very interestingly. Uh, interestingly. Um, but like, um, I think this is like also something that we need to do more in the future. And um, yeah, as um, I heard that all the successful COP were in sunny places. So in Egypt, I have good hopes that we will really get it um, on the agenda. But let's see. I mean, I'm, I'm interested to, to hear your opinion on that. Yeah. Um yeah, let's come on, Lucky Seven, and Egypt's such a beautiful country. Um, so, can I just say one thing? Please. I think that one of the things that's uh, easier for um, people to get behind is the concept of cultivated meat, right? Like you can have your meat and eat it too. And I think that that's something that we're probably going to start to hear more about. First, my guess is that with the methane reduction pledge, we'll start first, they're going to tackle food waste before they tackle animal agriculture. It's less mm -hmm. controversial. That's mm -hmm. just a prediction. And then cultivated meat, I think is going to be something that's easily embraced by all, not stressful to delegates to talk about. I think where we get into the personal choice uh, is asking people to reduce meat and animal product consumption. That seems to be the real sticking point, in my opinion. I'd love to hear from us and Raphael. And I want to hear from Lasse and Raphael too. I just want yep. to chime in there. I agree with you. And I think part of the hesitation this year could be culturally, we just came off of COVID that was so hard for, for everyone. I don't think politicians have the courage to tell people, well, now I'm taking your your what you like to eat every day. Obviously, we're not taking your food because there's so much better food out there for you. Uh, but we're going to we're going to not only did we like force you to be at home and you had to stay away from your job and the economy's all messed up, but now we're going to reach in and tell you what should be on your plate. So I think they're afraid to do that coming off of COVID, but I want to hear what you guys think. Lasse and Raphael. Lasse, please. Yeah, happy to come in on that. Well, I, I also think that, you know, alternative protein, whether it's plant-based or, or cell-based meat, um, will play a major role going forward. I think there is a huge messaging problem right now, which is not caused by us, so to speak, but caused by the, the uh, those who are not too keen on seeing that agenda coming up. And they're very specifically, a lot of the, um, yeah, exactly, blah, blah, blah. So commenting on the comment. It, it's um, those who are not really keen on happening. It's, you see, you see like cultivated meat, alternative protein coming more forward, like the big meat, meat producers and some countries have very successfully launched a discourse that is any resistance or, or a discourse against meat is against development because nobody can argue against the overconsumption in the global north, in the G20 countries particularly. But the problem is it is said in the same uh, sentence as talking about development, They're talking about nutrition deficiency, talking about stunting of children and so forth. And it's so wrong, it's such a wrong, wrong discourse because it, it's as a matter of fact, the industrialized livestock production is, is what in many cases are leading to to problems of nutrition insecurity and stunting of the kids because there's a focus on producing food that is not suitable for whatever part in the world it might be. And also, you know, there's sometimes an accusation of alternative meats being kind of like neo-colonial in its approach to the global south or to least developed countries, where in fact it is not. It is much more the the uh, the building of factory farms in, in areas that that brings put smallholders out of business. And you know the whole story around that. So there, I think there is a big role to play. We just need to change the discourse. And I think we can look at it very positively and we need to really tell the good story because if you look 10 years, 15, 20 years ahead in time, you know there's gonna be a much bigger need for producing food in the cities because cities are growing, more people living urbanized lives. And growing vegetables in cities is already becoming more and more possible right i'm not talking about greenhouses growing tomatoes and window seal but uh, yeah green huge greenhouses on top of factory buildings and so forth it's coming and here is the saving grace with alternative protein particularly cell-based meats because you can compare to microbreweries you could in fact have um um, uh, meat for production facilities all over cities, each neighborhood, each restaurant eventually, yeah. which would make it much more feasible and in line with a, grease, uh, a growing uh, urbanization. And that story is never told. So in fact, I think when it comes to development, when it comes to uh, eradicating uh, hunger and addressing food insecurity, cell-based meats and particularly uh, alternative protein as a whole has so much to offer and it's still such an untapped 
uh, thing to discuss in, to, to discuss in this space. If I can just jump in, like I, I just had like my first bite of cultivated meat yesterday at the um, I was like at an event in Rome, and uh, I have to say it's it's pretty. Uh, impressive uh and yeah i think it's gonna be like you know it depends like how fast we can like scale and like also like make sure that this technology is is, is used like you know in, in, in the right way but it's pretty impressive of course and like it's something that i will be very curious to see how the un and how the negotiations around that uh, will be evolving because it also has like a lot of like potential a lot of questions but like it's it's something that is going to be very very interesting so um, i saw that as a very distant reality a few years ago and now I really realize okay it's here and it's yeah just a question how do we make it accessible healthy and like you know everything that uh, that comes with it um with uh, with uh, this question of cellular agriculture and we are still working out the technology of cellular agriculture still not there yet in terms of really being able to do scale but as you talk about the actual for me it's the democratization of food so you know very few of us can afford filet mignon and particularly when you're talking about in the south but now everyone can have filet mignon. You know, there's it, it's just as easy to make filet mignon as it is to make a chicken breast if you're doing cultivated meat. So um, I I would say that this is kind of a breakthrough for people's um, access to food. Uh, but Carrie, did you want to say something there? Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, I think you know, to your point about democratizing it, when we think about the deforestation pledge or the methane pledge, obviously now you know, delegates need to go back to their home countries and work out the tactics on how they're going to get there. And wouldn't, you know, vast investments in research for cultivated meat be a great way to help us reach those goals? So I do think that there are ways in which we can help, we can encourage um, the acceleration of that technology so that it is affordable for all if we are really focused on these climate change goals. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see which delegates go home and actually get investment dollars put into this. And I see this really as a geopolitical issue. So I'm surprised politicians don't get on the bandwagon faster because, uh, you know, wars are going to be fought over water and food. Those are going to be in short supply as we're going to have less land and water to grow animals, basically animals. So land and water intensive. So it, if you keep going the way you're going with a growing population to 10 billion by 2050, but you're not getting more land and you're not getting more water. So these resources become more expensive and um, it's just going to be harder for people to get food. Uh, so this is where people are going to have a lot of political power, those who control food. So I would think those who invest in cultivated meat and start creating jobs around that kind of innovation would do much better in the future politically, which is why I think this really is a political subject in many ways. So I'm always surprised that people aren't getting on the bandwagon. But I, I digress. I go back to what you're saying about deforestation, which I think is interesting because deforestation to me is kind of a backdoor again to leaving an opportunity for us to talk about animal agriculture because so much deforestation takes place so that we can cut down trees, grow grains, grains that have protein, grains that have fiber. Do we give that food to people? No, we give it to animals. And then we give them land and water and time, land and water and time. We still haven't gotten any food from them. And then we have to cut down more trees, grow more grains, feed those grains again to animals and not people. So deforestation is so linked um, to animal agriculture, to me, do you see that as an open doorway, Carrie? Oh, I absolutely do. I mean, I, I think that, you know, cattle ranching is the number one culprit of tropical deforestation. So how are we not going to address cattle ranching when we have a deforestation pledge? I think that um, I'm hopeful by both the methane and deforestation pledges, quite frankly, because there is a huge door open for us to talk about the role of animal agriculture in meeting those goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this I thought was interesting. Um, and again, I sort of, I use the word cowardly, but not without compassion. I can understand how from a political standpoint, it's very tricky when you're still experiencing COVID in parts of the world and everyone still is almost um, shell-shocked from what they went through last year to start telling people that you're going to change their food. It just might be the last straw and they're afraid that people can't accept it right now, even though it's for their, their better uh, growth and tomorrow. So I understand the um, political environment. So a way to not be the one to bring it up is to put the carbon emissions 
on the menu items at COP26 and people can see for themselves. Oh, the beef burger has, I think it's 3.9 um, carbon uh, carbon dioxide emissions. So I'm sorry, 3.9 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions. And then I think haggis. And God knows what haggis is, really. It's anyone's guess. It was 3.6. And I think turkey meatball pasta was 0.9. And then a broccoli salad was 0.2. But people can do the math themselves. And you don't have to lecture anyone or talk or try to convince. What do you think about that tactic? Do you think it was accidental and they just didn't realize how stupid they were being? Or was it really wickedly smart? Lasse. Well, I think it was a good step in the right direction and you know awareness raising is always good and there has been attempts before in some countries where they use the labeling you know the the green orange yellow uh so sorry the green red yellow labeling just to make it easy for people to see i think it's a step in the right direction but i think to your point and how to bring the climate issue together with the deforestation and any other issues is that we need to be better to communicate about more of the things without overwhelming people because mm -hmm. Some people might think, yeah, you know what, I'll, I'll take that extra emissions, I'll take a shorter shower, I'll drive less, even though it doesn't add up. But, you know, people will might think like that. But if they also know that the deforestation and thereby the biodiversity loss, the infringement on indigenous people's uh, uh, communities and so forth related to cattle ranching in this case, um, they might think twice. And that's also why we are seeing there's a, a lot more uh, social justice and human rights organizations that are really starting to get on board with the uh, animal protein reduction issue because they see how it is essentially also a human rights issue. So I think if there's a clever way we can become better at communicating that, um, that would be good because otherwise we also end up uh, having some of those people who are only concerned about climate change uh, and um, and think that's the only way we think we need to to solve can look into the you know the classic of saying let's just cut away red meat let's go for intensive white meat so fish and chicken farming for instance right so there there's a lot of pitfalls there but conversely if we keep pointing to the fact that this is also constitutes human rights violation biodiversity loss deforestation and so forth that we're going to have many more allies that will be standing with us and saying we cannot take the easy solutions, we have to talk about reduction. Yes, and I like Biden jumping in and really saying, well, um, you know, be prepared for the impact on your wallet if you don't address climate change. Sorry, Carrie, did I cut you off there? I, I was wanted to jump in on, on the menu because um, oh, yeah. it was, you know, it was very, it was, it was complicated because at the same time there were like many more options uh, for like sandwiches and for like main dishes than like three or four years ago. I mean, I know that in Katowice it was very difficult to find anything. Um, vegetarian even like sometimes and it was like you know that there was really like a um, there was also like a an organization that like started like checking analyzing the menu and seeing that there was like i think it was the center for uh, biological diversity um that that did that but they, they were like you know just extremely meat intensive um we've been also pushing some youth movements like also for example food at cop that were like a group of activists from a lot of different countries that was very interesting and they were asking for having like a plant-based actually like menu i mean like entire menu at the cop arguing and saying that yeah we're at the climate conference you know it's not about being 100 vegan all the time etc it's just about like okay at lunchtime we could have like you know plant-based options um maybe only plant-based options or at least more plant-based options like any any way we could see it and that was a little bit disappointing along with maybe the quality and price of the food which is unaccessible to almost any i mean like many many people from just the south cannot spend like 12 20 euros and three sandwiches that don't oh, really yeah. like feed you that much so there is a lot of like you know issues around that i think they're making like progress and um because i i know that in madrid there was already like more options like two years ago um but it's it, it went in the right direction but i think um, I think that they're going to continue going like this way because there also were like, you know, a lot of people like that were noticing those uh, emissions uh, ne next to the menu uh, items. So it, it was like uh, it was 
but we, we can also like ask ourselves how come that it did it not happen like before because it was also something pretty obvious to do and i think this is also where we have to engage with the un more actively and like tell them like of course you need to put your your emissions and have like 75 percent plant-based uh, options um you know they promised 50 percent we got around 35 i think percent of the the items so sometimes it was a little bit difficult to find like also like a sandwich or you would just end up eating the same sandwich uh four times a day <laughs> and spend 30 dollars on that but yeah that's that's just like you know that's conference it's also difficult but it, it brought a lot of challenges i know from from delegates and colleagues from the south that could just not afford it actually mm -hmm. i, I want to feel like this this was the low-hanging fruit there's no reason why they can't be 100 percent plant-based at the conference i mean to me this is the easiest win <laughs> um uh, to me it just shows how scared they are to really take a stand like they can't even do it at their own conference where they risk throwing themselves under a bus by showing the obvious math and then saying, but we're not doing it. So we can't trust them to do a menu at COP. Why do we think they're really going to do 30 by 30? Okay, uh, I'll leave the world with that. Um, Raphael brought up what we need to do. So get back in there and, and have these more discussions with them. Um, UN counterparts. I'll start with Lasse. If you could answer for me, Lasse, what are your predictions going forward? And what would you like to see the average listener here do on this podcast? Well, the predictions going forward is that I think on the climate change food nexus, things are going to happen very fast next year. There are a lot of, there's a lot of hope. There's a particular lot of hope for making the MENA region, which is where, you know, both the Egyptian COP next year and potentially UAE for, for COP28 in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's a region focus there. And it happens to be the region in the world that has the biggest problem with water use uh, and, and uh, droughts and, and food production generally. Yeah. So I think there's a really good base for focusing very strongly there. So I predict this year is going to be, uh, has many more opportunities that we have ever seen ever before than the year leading up to the next COP. And one of the key things we have to focus on is building the voice from those voices that normally do not speak too much about meat reduction. And that comes back to the issue of like, who benefits, who loses out if the current consumption patterns happen. And you can compare that, it's getting a bit technical, but there's an aspect within UNFCCC called loss and damage. Essentially it's about those who created the problems with climate change should pay some money to those who are suffering from climate change who didn't created, right? And we should be using that much more in the discourse. So I think next year there's going to be stronger convergence. We're at least are going to work on that stronger convergence between the development, social justice aspect and the mm. animal protein reduction. And in terms of what people can do, um, there, you know, the Paris Agreement, the basic for the Paris Agreement was like, now we have a global um, agreement. Now things need to trickle down to the national level. But even more so, we're seeing it has to trickle down to a sub-national level, right? So it is very important that people, in addition to voting with what they buy, also continue adding pressure on their local councilmen, local mayors, mm -hmm. local senators in the U.S., for instance, because it really matters, because what comes up from the bottom towards the top really changes things. Just, just think like having Eric Adams becoming like the mayor of New York now and his perspective on food consumption, it's going to really, really matter, right? So anybody who has the opportunity, they should always put in the good word for the, the local councilman. Even a local councilman can trickle up and help change national policy, within, which then will feed into the international geopolitical scene as well. When you align your voice with your purchasing power, you will see change. Carrie, what are your predictions and what would you like everybody to do? Yeah, uh, my prediction, I'm not sure about COP27 and how much this topic will be addressed there, but I have great faith for COP28 um, because of the Aim for Climate initiative that was announced, um, the joint initiative between the US and uh, UAE. And I do think that on at COP28, we're going to see some real movement. And then as far as what people can do, um, Alex Lockwood from Sentient Media just wrote a great post yes. on this topic yeah. um, and listed out six things that people can do that are really concrete actions people can take. I would say the number one thing that I would that really resonated with me on that list, though, is to work with environmental groups. We're not doing a great job of that, I think, right now. Mm -hmm. And I think just getting in a closer lockstep with our friends and partners that lead very large environment and influential environmental organizations to 
work together to elevate this issue at future COPs. Okay, I like that. So uh, befriend your environmental agency and make sure you're working in tandem with them. Raphael, what are your predictions and what would you like people to do? Um, I'm usually not super optimistic, but I think actually that next year we're going to see like some first uh, really interesting elements. I mean, we saw like something in Glasgow at, the, at this time, and maybe it's just because Egypt sounds like such a fascinating uh, country and I've never been there. But like it's, it's just like um, I really think that we have tools now that uh, we have also like a better organized like civil society with networks like 50 by 40 and others that are really also joining forces trying to not repeat the same like either mistakes or like a success just like trying to also see what everybody is doing and i think um, there has been a much better coordination on that among civil society and putting pressure um and i think we'll, there is like still some progress that you know that we need to do like in communicating the topic in uh, discussing like the uh, economical impact because you know governments it's, it's you know consumers like talk with their wallet etc but like also like governments it's also for them like a key indicator the jobs um the popularity the, um, the challenges for several sectors that are strategically key from the electorate um yeah we've seen also like you know new governments coming in in germany that plays a, a very important role as european as the first agriculture in europe um and with possibly like you know some changes in the agricultural policy next year um starting next year so i actually think that uh, next COP, COP27 will be extremely important. Um, I'm very excited to already start like strategizing and working on this one. Uh, we have the UN Environment Assembly in between also in February, where we can put again the topics of uh, biodiversity, the deforestation environment uh, to the table and with the food systems connection, of course. Um, and I think, yeah, as Lasse said, like for what people, I mean, should do, could do, um, follow the discussions because sometimes we see a little bit of like people just getting so fed up with what they see as a lack of progress that they just throw the whole process under the bus but we have nothing better at the moment like from a climate perspective it's like it's already a big achievement Lasse reminded us also like about um, the fact that we were like on a target uh, on, on the trajectory to like much much worse uh, consequences a few years ago only so we can make those changes but it takes time patience it's frustrating um we mentioned several times like you know also like the decision makers not really taking that seriously uh, but i think it's going in the right direction we just need to figure out how to accelerate it as fast as possible because it's very important um, for food systems, but also for just the Paris Agreement and, and having a, um, a, a positive like future. Yeah. I don't want people to feel pain, but I wonder if people start to feel it on their wallet or they start to recognize that, gosh, it's really not going to be great for my kids. There's a little talk about that. Sometimes people think about legacy, but I think as this becomes more and more apparent, uh, job markets are affected, water, land use, food accessibility. I, I wonder if the um, countries from the South will be more vocal about getting their, their fair share of what is coming down on them and demanding that more is done. And if countries from the North will listen, we'll see. But um, I, I think it's going to move fast and furious and it's going to go in two directions. Either Plant-based options, an alternative food system, let's just say, uh, to be more efficient, which I believe would be plant-based options and cultivated meat, et cetera. The food system is going to shift and that's going to happen really fast. Or we're going to just jettison really out of the universe. <laughs> One of those is going to happen really, really fast. I want to thank all of you for being here. One word as we go from each of you, starting with Lasse, what's your favorite snack? You're running around, you're super busy, you don't have time for lunch. What is your go-to snack? Walnuts. Walnuts. Or did you say all nuts or walnuts? Walnuts. Walnuts. Well, all right. I don't get that one very often. Raphael, super busy. What's your go-to snack? Um, on the way, an apple. And when I'm in Paris, some vegan French pastries. <laughs> Ooh, I like it. I used to live in France. And uh, they did not have vegan French pastries when I was there. But it looks like I'm going to have to get myself back to Paris for some vegan French pastries and Egypt in 2022. Carrie, what is your go-to snack when you're running around and super busy? Uh, almond butter filled pretzels. Ooh, I like it. I do a lot of peanut butter and apples myself. I want to thank Lasse Brune of 50 by 40. Wanted to make sure I got those numbers right. I want to thank Raphael Podselver of ProVeg International. I want to say thank Carrie Valkier of Cool Planet Foods. 
and uh, making sure I get all the names right. It's been a crazy day, everybody. I want to thank you, all three of you, for all that you do and for dropping this knowledge for us today and for kind of taking us to COP26 for those who couldn't be here. But of course, the burden lies on us, everyone listening today. It's great that we have, you know, three representative boots on the ground in Scotland, but really it's up to us. And if you're going to wait for politicians, you're going to be waiting a long time. So you've got the power, you've got the dollars, your dollars speak ever so loudly. And when you accompany your dollars with your voice, I think you really will see change. So really it's up to us. We are not disempowered. We are empowered and we really don't have a choice. So it is our future. We should take hold of that. So everyone, you know, your marching orders, you know what to do. I want to thank all three of you for being with me. You guys stay put. Don't go anywhere. Everybody on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter. It has been wonderful to be with you and have a wonderful holiday. Bye everybody. I will see you next week.